Okay, so I want to welcome everyone. This is the first bioengineering colloquium of the fall semester, this uh, very unusual fall that we're having. Um, so this semester we've uh, assembled a great collection of speakers and um, as usual this includes both colleagues within Princeton and, and also um, external speakers. So we have highlight seminars by uh, faculty speakers from other universities. I also want to mention that um, this semester we're, we're going to start a new Rising Stars in Bioengineering seminar series within the BioE Colloquium um, and this is going to be a really nice opportunity to get to know grad students and postdoc colleagues at other institutions. Um, you can find information about about all these uh, talks on the Bioengineering Colloquium website. If you just search Princeton Bioengineering Colloquium you'll see that and um, we've been updating that just today and it should, should be there very shortly. Uh, but today's edition of Bioengineering Colloquium is particularly exciting and, a, and it's a great way to kick off the virtual series. Um, today's speaker is Malcolm Burns, who is a professor in the Department of uh, Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at Howard University in Washington, D.C. Um, so Dr. Burns has research interest in the structure of microbial enzymes. Um, but over the last several years, a number of years, he's focused a lot of energy on examining uh, the life and legacy of a pioneering biologist from the early 20th century, um, Ernest Everett Just, E.E. E. Just. Um, so it's an interesting story there. I'll just very quickly share that Ma Malcolm reached out to me about, uh, I don't know, maybe six years ago to ask if I was familiar with Just's work because, you know, aspects of my own research were related to um, questions that Just was pursuing, um, you know, at the, in the beginning of the last century. And since then, um, I have also become fascinated by E.E. E. Just. And so Malcolm's um, enthusiasm for the life and legacy of E.E. Just are quite infectious. And, and um, yeah, I've, I've actually gone pretty, pretty deep into this. And um, Malcolm turned me on to a, a wonderful book, I'm sure he'll mention, by uh, The Black Apollo of Science by Kenneth Manning. Uh, which I would I would highly recommend, um, and it, you know my own interests in research uh, closely relate to many of e. Just's interests, but also some personal things related to uh, his work at the Marine Biological Laboratory, where he spent many summers, um, and I, I spent some summers as well. So I was really thrilled that Malcolm accepted the invitation to speak today, and uh, I'm really really looking forward to uh, to the to this seminar. So a few minor housekeeping points. You may have heard the seminar is being recorded. Um, and also, um, Malcolm uh, said it would be fine if we uh, take questions uh, during his seminar. So you know, just like our in-person bio colloquium, I think he'd welcome um, uh, interruptions for, for questions. But we would ask that everyone um, turn off their video and mute themselves. And then when you go to ask a question, you, you don't need to raise your hand, just go ahead and turn on your video and your audio and you know, jump right in there. Malcolm has welcomed that. So without any further ado, it's, it's all yours, uh, Malcolm. Welcome to uh, Virtual Princeton. And uh, we're, we're really excited to, to hear from you today. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Cliff. Uh, it's a great honor and a privilege uh, for me to talk to you today. I'm sitting out here on my back back deck uh, in, in a suburb, suburb outside of Washington, D.C. And then this is what the pandemic has, has done to us. We're all in different places, you know, uh, uh, communicating by Zoom. Um, I think one other thing that uh, we've learned is that the pandemic has disproportionately affected certain populations, certain communities, especially African-American and other minority communities in America. And, and this summer has been a, a summer of protest as well. And uh, we are recognizing as a, as a society, the importance of black voices. And so um, I'm especially happy to be able to profile or highlight a particular black voice from the early 20th century. And that's the voice of Ernest Everett Just. Um, and, and I do wanna also show you my copy of the same book. I'm gonna uh, talk about um, uh, Ken Manning and his, his book. A lot of the biographical information uh, is coming from um, Black Apollo of Science by Kenneth Manning. And I also wanna uh, show you this book, 
okay? It's called The Vast Wonder of the World, Ernest Ever Just. It's a, uh, it's a children's picture book that was published in um, November 2018, written by uh, Melina Mangal and illustrated by Louisa Uribe. Uh, it's fantastic and um, it's fun for adults to read too. And the illustrations are, are really uh, vivid. And, uh, and really something else. So I'm gonna also show uh, an image from that book as well. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead now and, and share my screen. Okay, and um, um, I may or um, I'm not really gonna say a whole lot about this particular slide, except to say that E.E. E. Just was an, uh, a superb writer, thinker, uh, he was a poet in many ways, and he had a very philosophical bent, which actually got him in hot water sometimes. Uh, people uh, didn't really uh, appreciate that in a scientist, but uh, when you have a chance, you uh, read this uh, uh, if you get a chance. So um, the title of my talk today is The Genius of Ernest Everett Just. And I came up with this title because I was reading uh, Manning's biography and, and happened to see uh, uh, this excerpt. Uh, it's, it's from uh, a letter from Frank Lilly, who was just mentor uh, in Woods Hole and also uh, at the University of Chicago, written in 1939 to Ross Harrison, who was the chairman of the National Research Council. He said, quote, just has qualities of genius. Nothing whatever turns him aside from his purpose. I have attempted over and over again to get him to conform more to the conditions which his race and the university and university life in America impose. I think now that this attempt was unwise. Uh, so just truly was a genius in, in, in different ways. Um, uh, one of the most striking ways was that he was incredibly persistent. Uh, and he never gave up despite, despite the uh, uh, very difficult circumstances uh, that he faced uh, as an African-American trying to do serious um, scientific work um, in the early part of the 20th century. So I wanna again, um, uh, what's the right word? Pay homage, if you will, to uh, Ken Manning. Uh, and Black Apollo of Science, which he published in 1983, the 100th anniversary of, of the birth of E.E. E. Just. Uh, and this actually is a photograph uh, that I took of Ken uh, in Naples. You may recognize the Bay of Naples there, uh, lit by the evening uh, setting sun. Um, and this was atop on, at, at the top of a, um, a building where we had a reception after an international symposium that was uh, hosted by Luigi Santella of the um, Stazione um, Zoologico there in, in Naples, where Just had, had gone to study in 1929. I, and actually, I actually wrote a, a little reflective piece about my experience speaking at that symposium. Uh, and it was published in an online uh, magazine, a Howard online magazine. But, but I love this picture of, of Ken and because it was such a, such a good time, such, uh, such a great experience for all of us. He was a speaker as well, uh, as well as um, Stuart Newman, who's a colleague of mine and, and others. Luigi herself spoke. Um, so in addition to Black Apollo, I just wanna also mention these other uh, works here. One of them is this picture book by Melina and uh, Luigi. I'm not Luigi, Luisa, um, the vast wonder of the world. Um, I wanna also mention Just's own mag, uh, magnum opus, his um, The Biology of the Cell Surface, published in 1939. He also had another uh, book that he published uh, on basic, basic methods of uh, you know, in handling embryos and eggs of uh, marine invertebrates. He, that he published in 1939 as well. So he had two books. 
Uh, and then this, this essay uh, by uh, Stephen Jay Gould published in 1983 called Thwarted G Genius. It's actually a review of Manning's book, uh, but it's a great essay. And, and this one, which I discovered later by uh, uh, Shelby Grantham, who was an English professor at Dartmouth, where uh, Just went to college. And it was, I, I was really surprised when I read this because she had great insight, um, uh, even though she was uh, an English professor, great insight into Justin and his work, frankly. Uh, and then this one uh, by James Crow, published in 2008, Just and Unjust, E.E. E. Just. Uh, so those are some additional uh, interesting works that um, you could read. So today I want to give a sort of a bi biographical sketch, discuss the biological and philosophical milieu that existed when Just was alive, talk about his contributions, uh, introduce, his, introduce his concept of independent irritability of the cell, discuss some of his lesser known experiments briefly, the movement of water into and out of the egg cell, and then give some concluding thoughts. So let's start with a, a biographical sketch. Just was born uh, on August the 14th, um, 1883. So he just, re his birthday recently occurred. Uh, he was born in Charleston, South Carolina. He grew up uh, as a child on James Island, which, um, uh, so he went from the city to the island with, uh, with its great natural beauty. And actually, he fell in love with nature uh, from his experiences as a child on James Island. Uh, that's what Ken Manning tells us in his biography. Now, he was educated. He was really homeschooled, uh, mostly by his uh, very amazing mother, um, who, um, who was able to work hard in the phosphate mines of James Island and save money to buy some property from... Um, from the Hillsboro plantation that was being split apart after the end of the Civil War and sold off. So she bought some of that property. And actually, if you look up here on the right-hand corner, uh, she, the town that sprung up was, was a model of African-American uh, sort of sustainable or living or independent. Um, it was a town that sprung up um, in African-American that was self-governing. And it was called Maryville, it was named after her because she was, she was such a, um, a force uh, in that community. She established the first school, established a church in that community. Uh, but as you can see from this plaque uh, on a road there in, in Charleston, in 1936, the South Carolina General Assembly revoked the town charter, so it ceased to exist in 1936. But she was a, an amazing person. Um, so just after that, after being homeschooled as a, as a youngster, attended South Carolina State College um, in, in Orangeburg, uh, South Carolina, where he got a teaching degree. But he and his mother had greater plans for him. And, um, and he actually uh, made the trek up north to New England and arrived at Kimball Union Academy, which is a boarding school uh, in, in Meriden, New Hampshire. Um, he actually arrived there, even though they hadn't responded to his letters, but they accepted him and he did very well. Uh, he graduated from there and then went on to uh, Dartmouth College, uh, from which he graduated in 1907. And uh, at Dartmouth, he was an outstanding student, even though he uh, struggled in his freshman year. By the time he had graduated, uh, he was a, what's called a Rufus Choate Scholar. Uh, which is a, a very high honor, apparently, at Dartmouth, and get graduating magna cum laude with honors in sociology and history uh, and special honors in um, zoology. And he did also some independent research while he was at Dartmouth. So he really, uh, in biology. So um, right after graduating from Dartmouth, he, he got a position at Howard University, which is where I teach. And it, it was the premier um, institute, institution of higher learning for African-Americans. And here's a picture here of the, what's called Founders Library, which is a landmark on campus at Howard. Um, when, he was, when he went there, he was first hired to teach English. 
um, because of when he's when he was at Dartmouth he had first studied the classics so he studied ancient Greek you know Latin literature and in fact at Dartmouth he had the highest score ever achieved in Greek and I think that still stands um, to this day um, so so he was hired at first in English but but then later on the president of Howard um, wanted to establish a program in, bi in biology so they recognized that ju just had a background actually in biology so they hired him to be a biology teacher instructor well he rose quickly through the ranks um, he established a, a department of zoology and then at, at Howard and, and a master's degree program uh, he also became and he became a full professor in 1912 not only in the biology in the College of Arts and Sciences but also in the medical school where he was in the Department of Physiology and so he, he had these dual apartment appointments and he did very well um, rose through the ranks very quickly the other thing that happened is in 1909 he began to do research at um, at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole Massachusetts uh, under and he had been referred to uh, Frank Lilly by his old college uh, advisor uh, named William Patton and so he started to work under Lilly as an apprentice at first uh, in 1909 but then he really began to, to learn very quickly uh, and rose quickly to become a, an established independent investigator really at uh, in Woods Hole um, so Lilly was his advisor now Frank Lilly was not only di the director of the MBL but was also the chair of the Department of Zoology at the University of Chicago and so um, uh, around 1914-15 just went over to Chicago fulfilled his residence and requirements you know taking courses and such on campus uh, and in writing his uh, dissertation uh, which he got in 1916 and it was based on the work he did in Woods Hole with uh, under Lilly and the title was studies of fertilization in platinarius megalops which is a type of marine analyte okay so um, this work that he did in Woods Hole was really it really formed the foundation of all of his broad contributions to biology um, after 1930 he, he ceased to work at, at, um, at the MBL and, and did most of his work in Europe and he actually at that time sort of began to to shift his focus and become much more philosophical and broader in, in his approach to biology so um, so again after 1930 he uh, worked mainly in labs in Europe and in 1929 he took that uh, he took his first trip abroad and it was to the Stazione Zoologica in Naples that's that same place that I visited uh, many years just in in 2013 uh, and gave that talk and it uh, it's a very impressive place because it's been around for 150 years uh, and excellent research has been going on uh, it has a stellar um, international reputation in terms of research uh, and then shortly after that he was invited to uh, spend six months at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for uh, biology uh, in Berlin Dahlem and he he worked there in 1930 he went back again in 1931 uh, and um, and I, it, he did not go back after 1933 because of the rise of, 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 of Nazism in Germany uh, and uh, so that kind of put a damper on his uh, trips there but he did travel to Paris and, and he took may, maybe maybe 10 trips altogether to do research um, in Europe he went to you know Naples Paris uh, Switzerland and in the end in 1938 he ended up in Roscoff France which is on the Brittany coast and it's a, there was a small research marine research lab there okay he settled there uh, and he had intended to stay there actually uh, but in 1940 the, the Nazis took over France and he was forced to leave uh, so he had to go back uh, went back to Howard uh, but in 1941 October he 
he uh, passed away of pancreatic cancer, actually. So that that's um. So um, that's that's kind of the the, uh, the story of just life in a nutshell. It's um, laid out in, in Ken Manning's excellent biography. But in the nineteen in the early nineteen nineties, um, biology was quote a house divided, says Scott Gilbert, who's a who's a science historian and developmental biologist who's written uh, a textbook, an excellent textbook that's now in its, I don't know, 10th or 11th edition. Um, uh, but he's also a science historian. So biology was a house divided. And so the, the, on one side were the embryologists with their egalitarian view. And on the other side were the newly emerging geneticists who felt that, you know, genes in the nucleus controlled things in the cell and controlled heredity. Um, so, so Morgan's nucleocentric view, uh, according, according to, to Gilbert, drove a wedge into embryology and split it. Um, uh, because they began to, so originally there was sort of an uneasy truce between the embryologists and the newly emerging geneticists. But then what happened is the geneticists began to look into the cytoplasm outside the nucleus at gene expression. And so they, quote, laid claim to the embryology. So there was this big conflict going on. Just was a, a tried and true classical embryologist. Uh, and one thing he tried to do was bridge the gap. And I'm gonna talk about a theory that he developed called the theory of genetic restriction, in which he tried to bridge that gap between the two fields. Um, he was an outspoken critic of the gen geneticist perspective. What he stressed, was nuclear cytoplasmic dialogue, okay? So now let me talk a little, about, bit, a little bit about just contributions. I'm just gonna, this is sort of a list of them, right? So he authored two books, those two books I mentioned, about 70 papers. He studied the breeding habits of marine invertebrates. He looked at the egg cell cortex, which he called the ectoplasm and examined how it changed during fertilization and early development. He discovered what's known as the fast block to polyspermy in marine invertebrates and further elucidated the slow block, okay? He extended Lilly's fertilizin theory or hypothesis of fertilization. He proved that Jacques Lerbe's uh, explanation of parthenogenesis was not correct. He challenged Thomas St. Morgan and introduced his rival theory of genetic restriction, he was the first to show an important role for, cells, for the cell surface in cell-cell adhesion during early development. And he introduced the concept of a cell's independent irritability. So I want to discuss some of these. Uh, one thing I want to say, by the way, is if anybody has any, any questions as I'm going along, please pop up and, and ask it, okay? All right. Uh, so, these were some of the uh, marine invertebrates whose eggs just studied. I just wanted to show you these, right? So we have a Echinarachnius uh, parma, which is the sand dollar, Pudinarius dumarillii, which is a European marine annelid, um, Catoteris pergmentaceus, um, uh, which is called the parchment worm, apparently. And then we have uh, Nereus lambada, which was studied which lives off the coast of uh, Woods Hole and that just studied a lot, and Arbacea punctulata, which is the um, sea urchin, the purple sea urchin. Uh, he also studied uh, Kenarachnus quite a bit. So you'll see some of these names pop up as I go along. So one thing I want to stress is that Just was a naturalist at heart, okay? He was and um, this is a, a, uh, an image from that, that a picture book that I mentioned by uh, Melina and uh, Louisa, okay? published in 2018. It shows him here in Eel Pond uh, in Woods Hole um, uh, studying the breeding habits of Nereus lambata. And I just want to read, read us, uh, uh, this small uh, excerpt from his paper, research paper, describing this breeding behavior. He says, the animals may be taken after sunset on certain nights, in general during the, quote, dark of the moon. In the months of June, July, August, and September, they appear swimming near the surface of the water very soon after sunset and may be attracted by the light of the lantern and readily caught with a small hand net. 
And then he goes on to describe, you know, their breeding behavior in more detail. But I just think that, you know, he writes so incredibly, incredibly well, and uh, it's almost poetic. I just am struck by that uh, every time I read that, this passage. So one thing I've uh, stressed is that uh, he could be considered to be, quote, an early eco-devo biologist, that is an early ecological developmental biologist, right? So this is a picture of uh, Eel Pond in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, around 1928 to 29. So this is where he was, where he was that night, right? Um, looking at the breeding behavior of Nereus. But I, I uh, made this uh, argument based on three lines of evidence, okay? First of all, he was deeply familiar with the natural settings of the development development of the animals he studied, right? So he, more than anyone, knew the natural history. Okay, so what is ECODEVO? ECODEVO stands for Ecological Developmental Biology, and it focuses on uh, development in the natural setting, development as it occurs in nature as opposed to a laboratory. Now, what he did as a result of his deep knowledge of natural history was he brought into the lab conditions that tried to mimic or recapitulate conditions that existed in nature. And that's one reason why he was so incredibly successful in getting uh, embryos to develop. He really paid very close attention to the conditions and he insisted on maintaining what, what he called the normality of the egg under study. And the other thing is, the third thing is that he held a view called organicism, right? It's also called materialistic holism, and it believes that, you know, the, how, how does that go? The whole is greater than the sum of its parts, right? And that each, there are different layers of organization. You have to consider each layer in the context of the layer below and above, right? And, 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 and each, each property is informed by you know, the layer below and above, that the whole, whole system has to be considered uh, together, right? Not just from a bottom up, but also from a top down perspective. So that was kind of, that's kind of the view there. Um, he studied the fertilization reactions of Nereus and, and Echinarachnius. And on the left here, we see uh, his, some of his um, results. These are, uh, he actually, looked at the egg as it was being fertilized and, and uh, stopped the process, you know, e every few seconds um, and saw and then um, fixed and sliced the, the egg into thin sections and could see what was happening at the, at the surface, right? And so we see here an, an egg that's not fertilized and then one where the sperm has, uh, bound to the surface and you see this, this bubble forming and, and then so on, the sperm head is pulled in. And then, then what happens is that the um, fertilization envelope is called, begins to form. And then in, in, in the bottom here, it's fully formed after two minutes. And then here after 10 minutes, you see what it looks like. So he described that. And again, uh, here's some of his language. And he used a light microscope. Under the impact of the spermatozoan, the egg surface gives way and then rebounds. The egg membrane moves in and out beneath the actively moving spermatozoan for a second or two. Then suddenly, the spermatozoan becomes motionless with its tip buried in a slight indentation. And it's in the slight indentation of the egg surface, at which point the ectoplasm develops a cloudy appearance. This turbidity spreads from here so that the whole ectoplasm is cloudy. Now, like a flash beginning at the point of sperm attachment, a wave sweeps over the surface of the egg, clearing up the ectoplasm as it passes. So this wave, uh, he called it a wave of negativity, okay? Um, where the sperm bound or attached to the egg surface, that site, that entry site, was considered to be negative. And initially, all areas uh, around the egg were positive, but quickly, as the wave spread from the point of attachment around the egg, okay, those, though the surface became negative, right? And, and so the 
the wave immunized the egg to other sperm as it moved around. Now, one thing that um, just emphasized was that this wave of negativity um, happened very fast, and it was not the same as the wave of um, fertilization envelope liftoff, right? That physical separation. Um, and so, so he described now, we realize, he was describing what's known as the fast block, right? The fast block to polyspermy. It's an almost instantaneous block, okay, to uh, more than one sperm. It's a, it ensures monospermy. So later on in the 1970s, uh, a scientist by the name of Lorinda Jaffe um, proposed that the fast block is actually due to membrane depolarization and occurs instantaneously uh, upon sperm attachment. Um, this has been the uh, accepted model, uh, and, uh, but, but just was the first to, to sort of infer the existence of that, of that fast block, right? He also studied the slow block, which was due to the fertilization envelope liftoff. Now, one thing I do wanna say real quickly here is that this idea that the fast block to polyspermy is electrically mediated is being challenged by, by Luigi Centella and his group and her group, uh, who were saying that in fact, it's the cortical um, actin cytoskeleton uh, that's, that's causing this block. It's not electrical, it's actual, actually due to the actin cytoskeleton. So, so that, that has not been uh, resolved yet. There's still controversy on the exact nature of the fast, of the fast block. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I don't know how much time I have, a, have to really talk about the fertilism theory. Uh, it was proposed by um, Just mentor Frank Lilly and Just um, extended this, this theory and showed that it was true for a number of different uh, species. In 1930, he wrote a long defense of the theory, but nonetheless, Jacques Lerb's rival theory, known as the Lysin theory, uh, became more dominant and accepted. Um, and basically this theory proposed that when, it, uh, when an egg cell is in a fertilizable state in nature in seawater, it gives off a, an agent called fertilism that binds to and activates a sperm. And when the sperm binds, an ovophile um, side chain on the fertilism interacts with the egg, with an egg receptor, causing, causing it to be uh, fertilized. What was attractive to just, okay, was that uh, several things. One, uh, the sperm was not interacting directly, but had to, uh, um, that interaction occurred through, indirectly through, through fertilism, right? So it gave the sperm a secondary role, okay? And uh, it was, this was happening at the cell surface, the egg cell surface, which was the focus of just uh, life's work. He studied the ectoplasm. So he, he felt it was a very attractive uh, theory. And, uh, and today we know that in fact, this isn't quite the way things happen. There are two separate agents um, that are involved. Um, one that activates a sperm, which then interacts directly through uh, its receptor on the, on the egg surface. Uh, so this is for marine invertebrates. So such as uh, sea urchins. Um, so, so it doesn't quite happen the way they envisioned, but this was part of just work. Um, so Ernest Everett Just um, was not shy about challenging people that he uh, didn't agree with. And one of these was Thomas Hunt Morgan, uh, who he, who, as we know, um, proposed the gene theory. The genes are uh, arrayed um, in, in linear arrays, arranged in linear arrays on chromosomes. Uh, and that genes determine the, um, you know, they determine what happens in the cell and also the, the agents of, of inheritance, right? So, um, right. So, um, now Just didn't, didn't accept this, this uh, theory. And in 1935, at the annual meeting of the American Society of Zoologists in Princeton, your, your fair university, he took on uh, Thomas Hunt Morgan, okay? And, and he proposed his own theory, which was called, which he called 
the theory of genetic restriction, okay? To explain the specialization of cells and tissues during embryonic cleavage and differentiation. And this theory highlighted um, nuclear cytoplasmic dialogue. Instead of the nucleus doing things and controlling things, genes in the nucleus controlling things, there was more of a dialogue, right? So this theory features, um, has features that agree with um, epigenetics today. And so here's uh, from the biology of the cell surface, just wrote, genetic restriction then depends upon the removal by the nucleus of certain materials from the cytoplasm, leaving others free. It's the free materials that determine the character then of the cell as it uh, goes through uh, differentiation. Now here's a, a theory that I, I, not a theory, but an idea that I had, okay? And I published this in 2015 in the Journal of African American Studies. And that is, you know, this idea in just theory of genetic restriction that the role of the nucleus is to remove a subset of materials from the cytoplasm, leaving others free. And it's those free materials that then determine the properties of the cell as it's developing into a certain cell type, okay? So I, I have argued that that idea actually came out of the black intellectual community that just was a part of, okay? Because the 1920s was an intense period of upheaval and cultural expression in the black community. Scientific racism was dominant. And at Howard University, you had Elaine Locke, known as the father of the Harlem Renaissance, who said that nations will succeed when they embrace cultural exchange among groups within and outside their borders. He believed in cultural reciprocity. We had W.E.D. Du Bois, who was saying that race is not biologically derived, but arises from the history and culture of a group. So we had these ideas that were percolating, and I think they informed his own ideas, just like you know, Thomas Malthus informed um, Charles Darwin uh, and, 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 and gave the kernel of the thought, right, for uh, evolution by natural selection. So that's, that's an argument I've made. And so for just the cell uh, is a microcosm of, of a human society in which groups that have been on the periphery actually have the more important role to play, okay? So this is not an, uh, a foreign idea right, that scientists can borrow ideas from their own lives and their own experiences. In fact, I would say this is why we need diversity in science. We need those fresh ideas that arise and that come from, right, people's experiences and their, their cultural backgrounds, their ethnicity, right? So anyway, I just, that's, I've written about that. Um, I don't know how much I can talk about all these different things. He had a conflict with Jacques Loeb. I talked about how he just did not uh, agree with Loeb and his reductionistic views. Loeb had discovered artificial um, parthenogenesis or experimental parthenogenesis around 1900. Uh, and later he developed this two-stage method of inducing parthenogenesis, but just experimentally and systematically dismantled his theory, basically attacked his science, okay? So uh, this made Lerb very angry. And <laughs> Lerb, who died in 1924, although he was at first an advocate for just, and actually an advocate for racial uplift, began to uh, seriously undermine just in his own career ambitions and called him, you know, a person of low intelligence, you know, uh, incompetent, and that he should go and teach high school somewhere. So uh, anyway, but the main source of just angst was how Lerb's discovery was being interpreted by others, okay? Um, and, and, and what just believed was that the egg possesses something called independent irritability. So I'm gonna talk about that, right? So this was just lament. Here lay at the same time, the possibilities and the failure of the work on experimental parthenogenesis. Every single investigator who erred in proving an external agent or agents to be the cause of development, neglecting an opportunity to extend our knowledge concerning that fundal manifestation of living matter, its independent irritability. Okay. 
So I'm going to talk just a little bit about that. Um, and what I've, uh, what I've argued is that Johannes Holtfrieder, who was an important uh, uh, researcher in um, amphibian morphogenesis, picked up on Just's idea of independent irritability and incorporated it into his explanation for embryonic induction and competence. Okay. And then uh, Mark Kirshner and John Gerhardt, in devising their um, theory of facilitated variation to explain how organisms can evolve as embryos and, and hang together physiologically in the process, that they, they in turn, uh, used Holtfrieder's idea of uh, you know, auto-induction, he called it, right, uh, or auto-neuralization. And so, and so I tried to trace, you know, from just to Holtfrieder to Kirshner and Gerhardt and say, really, you know, really, it's because it's, it's just funny. I, you know, when I read this book in 2014, The Plausibility of Life, I was just dumb, uh, dumbfounded. I was awestruck or just, you know, I could see the fingerprints of just uh, in, in that book. So uh, then I wrote a paper about it, it was, and it was actually just published in print uh, this spring. Um, but I don't know how, so if you look at the language of Holtfrieder in the middle here, and of just, of just <clears throat> in describing independent irritability, and then of Kirshner and Gerhardt in talking about weak linkage, the, the, the similarity is just striking. I'll just say that. <clears throat> so, and so it's that, it's that concept of weak linkage, really, right? That, that bears greatest similarity to um, independent irritability. So just believe that the egg cell and every cell has this ability to respond in a physiologically relevant way to a nonspecific trigger on its surface, right? So, you know, it could be a sperm, uh, sperm or it could be some other experimental variable. And what Holtfrieder found was that uh, he, des he described a phenomenon known as autoinduction or autoneuralization, where in the um, amphibian gastrula ectoderm, right, you can trigger uh, you can trigger the development into neural tissue with a variety of different agents. And he wondered how could that how could that be, right? So he eventually came up with an explanation. And he said that, um, you know, the treatments merely operated like an unspecific trigger, setting in motion a pent up pre existing mechanism, which through unknown chains of events led to neural differentiation. I called this auto induction. Right, what do um, Kirshner and Gerhardt say? In, in weak linkage, which, which is a, a property that, um, that embryos have that allow them to mix and match. Um, uh, processes and components in order to uh, respond uh, to um, and come up with novel traits, right, during evolution. He said weak linkage, um, in weak linkage, the signal is minimally informative and not instructional, whereas the response is maximally prepared and ready to be triggered. A preconditioned response, which is self-inhibited, is released by the signal, right? So, so what I've argued is that, you know, just has had this, this impact now on biology because this is a very, I think, influential uh, theory that Kirshner and Gerhardt have. Um, and so here's some phenomena that exhibit weak linkage, embryonic induction and competence that I talked about, signal transduction involving switch-like allosteric proteins, and we can think of the two-state hemoglobin molecule and other, you know, uh, molecules in signal transduction pathways that have a sort of a switch-like behavior, right? Uh, that's been extended now to an ensemble behavior of, of a model of allosteri. So, you know, these proteins, developmental plasticity displays weak linkage, and cell fate uh, transition uh, plasticity also does. Uh, and, um, and so I've, you know, uh, I've written about that. Um, so it's, it's on the hour now, but, and I'll go for another, I don't know, few minutes, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah.
Okay, so I just want to talk briefly about these waters looking into the move, uh, these experiments looking into the movement of water into and out of cells. And um, so I just want to sort of read some things from uh, just book, The Biology of the Cell Surface. Okay, so one thing he emphasizes is that the rhythm of water loss and gain by a cell is a key to the puzzle of the oscillatory changes which characterize life. Okay. So he placed Arbacea eggs in hypotonic seawater and then returned them to normal, right? And he could see and look at the movement of water into and out of cells using the microscope, right? And, excuse me, he had to, he ensured that the eggs were normal as uh, determined by their retention of normal fertilizability. That was critically important, right? And he found the lowest hypotonicity that would allow recovery to a perfectly normal condition. And then he made some observations when he did the experiments. One, on return to normal seawater, water drops form near the egg center and they move outward, becoming elongated as they cross the ectoplasm, okay? Two, the ectoplasm is a sieve with extremely small openings. And three, the drops are pressed out of structures that exist within the cell. So he was discovering, right, features of the internal structure of the cell by looking at the movement of water into and out of the cells. Um, and then, then he saw that there was, um, that the water drops uh, appear more clearly in the fertilized egg. They vary in rate of formation during cle the cleavage cycle. And, quote, they appear in relation to physiological rhythmical changes coincident with the division cycle, right? So differences in the formation of drops in different blastomeres of the cleavage embryo can give clues about chemical changes that are associated with the progressive restriction that accompanies cleavage, right? This sort of differentiation of the cells in the, in the, in the um, cleavage embryo, right? Um, I wanna say that um, Just was assisted in these experiments by a young woman by the name of Roger Arlen or Young and that he did not cite her or he did not include her on those publications, which I think was a, a real um, oversight and somewhat of an injustice actually on his part. I just wanna say that, that she didn't assist him in these experiments, looking at the movement of water into and out of cells and also the effect of UV light on cells. And I wanna say that this kind of work that just did has links to not only Cliff's work, but also Kevin Shalhoub that I talked about earlier, Guillaume Charas, Alba Diz Munoz, Dan Needleman, and Luigi Santella as well. And, and these, these studies that these guys are doing are looking at you know, cell hydraulics and physical phenomena um, that uh, the role of physical phenomena in signaling, gene expression, and differentiation. So there's a link with, with what's going on today. Uh, and then finally, I just want to I want to talk a little bit here about how EE just challenged fellow scientists' conceptions of race and achievement, okay? And um, I would be remiss not to do that, especially uh, in this time when we, um, when we are uh, focus, focusing as a society, hopefully, on racial injustice and on structural race, racism. Because the truth is that what just experienced was an extremely egregious example of structural racism. He could not obtain a faculty position at a major research university despite international standing. Howard did not have that uh, designation at that point, at that time. He struggled to obtain funding. Throughout his career, he wrote letters to all kinds of people pleading for support including Mussolini and later Lady Astor of the UK. Um, and I want to give two examples and one story. In 1929, he applied for support from the Carnegie Institution and an evaluator of his, of his request was Charles B. Davenport. Now, I, don't know if you know, I don't know if you know who that is. He, is, uh, he was a, a prominent American eugenicist. He published a paper called titled uh, Race Crossing in Jamaica, in which he argued that people of mixed race, which just was because his grandfather was white, 
were, quote, muzzle, uh, muddled and wuzzle-headed, okay? Now, I don't know about you, but if I hear language like that, I think that's not at all scientific. Nonetheless, this dude here was evaluating just work. So this is what he had to face, right? Where his applications were given out to avowed eugenicists for evaluation. Uh, and then I want to tell a story. So in, in nine, this is from uh, Manning's book. So in 1928, just applied to the Rosenwald Fund for a grant, okay? Uh, it was uh, for a five-year, $80,000 grant from, uh, from the Rosenwald Fund. And the president of the Rosenwald Fund at the time, whose name was Edwin Embray, Embray liked Just. He thought he was doing great work and he wanted him to be able to get funded, okay? So what he did was he, he sent the application out to a guy named Ralph Lilly. Now, Ralph was Frank Lilly's brother, and he was a prominent physiologist. Ralph also liked Justin, his work, and he wanted him to get funded. But he had this internal conflict. And it was, so, okay, so um, he does great work, but he's black. He's a Negro. Uh, how, can that, how can that be? How can a Negro do great work, right? So... He hit upon a brilliant idea, which was that he would tell the board, which would be evaluating just uh, application, right? That just was in fact three fourths white, right? So that worked for that panel, for that board. They gave him the grant. It was the largest grant he ever got. Five year grant, $80,000, you know? But, but I'm just thinking about, you know, what would that do to a person, right? Like E.E. E. Just. To, to, to learn that that was the basis for his funding. It, it just seems so, I, you know, I, I would just be angry all the time if, if I had to deal with that kind of stuff. And, but he had to deal with that all the time. You know, that they couldn't accept him and his, and his qualities, right, and his work. They could only accept him because he was, quote unquote, three-fourths white. So anyway, I just want to say that, you know, the things he had to deal with were, it, incredible, incredibly difficult, and, and yet he was incredibly persistent. And he succeeded in making a mark uh, on biology today. So um, just a couple more things here. One thing I want, this is, uh, this guy in this picture is Theo Walker. He came to Howard in his, you know, Black Apollo. He came to, this is the Moreland Spingarn uh, Research Center at Howard University. Theo discovered an unpublished manuscript of Just that was mentioned in uh, Ken Manning's book. And uh, it has 219 pages, nine chapters, and a postscript. And I'm involved in a project to try to help get it uh, published with Theo and his assistant, Lily Jenkins. Uh, he's at uh, SMU. Uh, and so we're, we're working on it. And right now I'm trying to uh, construct, uh, reconstruct the bibliography uh, based on you know, the references it just has in his, uh, in his text. It's very philosophical, so I'm gonna have to trying to find some philosophers who can help me, you know, identify sources. But just goal in this book, in this manuscript, is to trace human ethical behavior through, back through evolutionary history to its origin in the structure and dynamics of the cell. It's a pretty audacious uh, project there. Um, and, but uh, it's, it's an exciting uh, project of, the, of, of trying to get that published. I just want to read a, just a few things on what Just had to say about race and culture. Uh, this is from the unpublished manuscript. So about race, he says, quote, to be sure there are races of man, so-called, but man's racial characteristics have no fundamental biological significance. Quote, the arguments put forward against the singleness of the human species curiously resemble those of demagogues who, though avowing themselves Christians, deny the brotherhood of man. And also, quote, political, social, or caste, and sociological considerations aside, we view the question as strictly biological. There are no races of man, unquote. And then about culture, he had this to say, no one who has even a superficial acquaintance with studies on savage man can any longer sustain Hume's position, which is that ethics is an endowment of civilized man alone. So I just want to put, uh, put those out because uh, there's some maybe some confusion out there about how just felt about issues of race and, and I just want to make that clear. 
So, um, and then finally end here with some words of wisdom from um, Ken Manning about just, he said, and this was from a 2008 symposium we had on the campus of Howard University, uh, Ken came and spoke. He said, I liked the way just was. He looked for quality. He didn't care who had it or where it was. He looked for the thing itself, right? Look for it, the thing itself. I think that we are in a good position to bring this notion of, to science and to actually become leaders. We have a way to go. As evaluators, gatekeepers, we have to be as wise and sensitive, sensitive as we can. If we can do that, I think the legacy of just will carry on and our scientific enterprise will have the diversity that we want and deserve. So um, that's it. I just want to thank Scott Gilbert, who helped me in the early stages of my work on just, Mark Kirshner, who is very encouraging in this last publication of mine, George Langford at uh, Syracuse University, who has always encouraged me in my work. Of course, Ken Stuart Newman at New York Medical College, who has been a collaborator. Uh, the NSF for uh, funding that symposium we had in 2008, and then uh, the NIH for funding my own research in my own lab. So that's it. These are some of the articles that I've uh, written on, on the topic of EEJUST.